album uh, Hurtling Towards Extinction. Kalakas. Uh, okay, so first thing, first things first, the core sound of the band, listening to the, the, the 12 songs on this album and then listening to the uncorked release and the older material, there's a thread. And then this, this is jumping over almost a half century's worth of time between the two, 40 odd years, or really, I should say, between the two. How would you describe the whatever is the core musical combination of the group? How would you define the Kalaka sound, given that there are so many different sounds throughout the and a given album? Well, thank you. That's a great comment. Um, we come from the late 60s, early 70s. The 60s were the time when guys, young people like us, were thrilled by the Beatles, by Hendrix, by the explosion of guitar music, you know, watching Johnny Winter in his prime, people like that. And so we wanted to be part of that. So back then, uh, if you recall, the Rolling Stones, for example, listen to the Early Stones, you could hear every single word that Mick Jagger was singing, clearly. Um, there was never a question, what are the lyrics? It was absolutely clear. And I think we come from that DNA, where you start with a vocal, um, but we also, in the 70s, you, you got into a lot more kind of um, big sound with a lot of reverb and, a lot, you know, grand sounding bands. And I think we decided in our recordings that we didn't need a whole lot of that. We, we You'll see our, our recordings are kind of, everything is kind of clear. Uh, there's not a lot of enhancement. Um, so we wanted to hear the drums. We wanted to hear the bass. I wanted you to hear the noise that the drummer makes going from the cymbals to the snare, take you back to those days when you went to those dances at high school and uh, standing at the back wall, looking at all the pretty girls. And we wanted to recreate some of the magic that got us into it in the first place. Singing, you could hear the drums, the bass, and, and of course we're a guitar band. So when it's, you know, you wanna hear lead guitar, we're, we come right from that tradition with George Habistro. How did you, and, and I think I've read a little bit that you started to connect with him um, and that kind of got the ball rolling, but more specifically and on the timeline as well, when did the new music start to come about and the idea of, hey, let's do a new album here in the 2010s, 2020s? So what happened is we went our separate ways. We, we paid a lot of dues, a lot of gigs in the 70s. That we worked really hard. It was difficult. We, we then did our album, mixed it down. And we promoted it, and then we we went on separate paths. Well, um, I went to Washington and kind of pushed it all in the background. I got a job in the Pentagon. I was in the White House, the State Department. No one ever knew anything about music. Um, even my wife never heard me sing for a long time. I, I'm not a kind of guy who wants to jump up in front of a party and sing. That's just it, it takes a little bit of nudging. <laughs> so. Um, so, but I, there I was much later on and a bunch of diplomats and officials in Washington approached me and said, we, we, we want to form a band, the Hungarian ambassador who grew up behind the Iron Curtain and he loved traffic and a lot of the music that was forbidden in Hungary. And he became a huge rock fan. So he came to America as the ambassador and started a band. I said, no, no way. And he said, well, Skunk Baxter's going to be in the band. And I said, no, he isn't. Are you kidding me? The legendary, you know, Steely Dan, Doobie Brothers. So Skunk Baxter came to a lunch and he said, um, he said, actually, you know, he was consulting for the intelligence community. He's a really smart guy. And he said, you know, if I'm in the band, I'm in. <laughs> and that just changed my life. So suddenly we're doing charity performances with Skunk Baxter. I, you can't imagine singing something like, uh, you know, reeling in the years. And then he's playing the lead right next to you is yeah, I can't describe what that's like. So that was fun. And what happened is our drummer, Carl Kennedy, found the two-inch tapes from the whole catalog of Kalakas from the 70s. And I said, okay, take them to a studio, run them on a digital, and send me the raw tracks. Because I got back into recording once I, was, once I was back into music. And we remixed the whole album, put out a CD called Kalakas Uncorked, which you mentioned in 2015. And what happened is, some of the critics listened to it and said, okay, 37 years ago, but these guys are pretty good. I kind of like this, you know, and that, <laughs> that affected us. We said, really? Okay, let's see if we can make some new music. And that started the ball rolling. We did Florida flash flood first. And I say that because when you listen to 
you wonder, well, what has 45 years done to these guys? So they've slowed down. <laughs> and then you listen to Florida Flash Flood. Mm-hmm. There was so much energy that just, it was like a volcano going off. And then we just kept going until we had 12 songs. And we, and when we brought it forward and we were lucky enough to, mm-hmm. you know, to get signed up with Deco Entertainment, um, we, then we found out, well, actually 12 is too much. It's a double album. So we thought, okay, well, that's a little more effort, but but we're happy. We got a beautiful vinyl double LP collector's edition plus digital plus CD. It's all coming out and we're, we couldn't be happier. You wrote a few songs on, on the album, like The Lone Road and Play It Like You Mean It, Back to Me, et, et cetera. Uh, how does your songwriting process work? Is it collaborative? Like, I mean, it's, what I mean by collaborative is you write your own song, but then through the rest of the members of the band, how do you come up with material? How does you bounce it back and forth off of each other? So that's really, really interesting. Um, because first of all, I think George is the one guy, we're sort of uh, a two man club when it comes to talking about each other's music. Um, I'll send something to George, like if I'm singing a vocal and he'll say, you really need to step it up. That's too soft. And he'll be honest with me and just say, I'm not hearing that's you want to do this differently. And he's the one guy who could just say that and I'll do it um, because he's right. (laughs) And he knows my music better than I know it. And I know his music probably better than he knows it. So so that's one thing. But the other thing, you know, is that all I do is I build a frame. I, I am not the world's most I'm not the guy you want to stand up there and just riff all day in front of people because I'm not. I can I have a piano sitting behind me. I can practice until I have a part down. I can do bass parts. I can do rhythm guitar, this and that. But George is a real star. And uh, and so I will set the table. We'll get some basic tracks. And then if I send it to him, he's going to send me all these takes that are all spontaneous. And he'll say, I trust you. Show me, you know, find some. What did I do? And And so now the canvas suddenly has all this edgy art on it that I didn't think about. He puts it on there. So, and then when I when we finally take take the drums out in a click track and put it in front of Carl, you know, he has to do a one take deal. So he has to internalize all that and get in the right spirit and then rip a drum track, which he does. And I'm so proud of him. Like the Lone Road is an incredible drum track. I couldn't have asked for a better drum track. And he just he just took it to another level. So I answer is, you know, we kind of have an idea. It starts with the vocal. Okay, but then when you put it in front of these guys, Mark Sisson with his pedal steel and lap steel, he's going to add something that I never thought of. How could I? And and it just the, the canvas fills in, and you never know what you're going to end up with. And that's kind of the fun thing about it. You just you, you just say, okay, this is a creative band. They have their own DNA. Let's see what comes out at the end. And it always sounds different when the last track goes in. It's suddenly a whole different song. I was wondering, listening to a little bit off, off of Uncorked and then hearing how you sound today, and like, like I said earlier about the, the similarities, but let's say time, the timeline is different. Gone Are the Days becomes a hit. You have some hit singles, gets on American Top 40, et cetera. You start touring around and you actually put a bit of, put in a bit of a foothold, if you will. How is Kalakas' path then different if, all right, now here comes the follow-up, and this is, of course... Thinking late seventies, getting into the eighties. There's, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking from the perspective of the music I play on my station, which is a lot of seventies and eighties pop music. And there's the transition out of disco, rock kind of comes back in. Where does, where do you think your band would have gone if it, if something had clicked and you became nationally famous? You're on American Bandstand, all of that sort of stuff. How did, how would it have evolved differently? Boy. What a, that's, that is probably the biggest question anyone could ask because it didn't happen. We, you always dream it's going to happen, uh, but we focused on our music and just kept polishing it until we could put it out there and then had no idea how to promote it. And, and you know, in the end, we learned to, to, to do it just for the music. I mean, the, the answer is, if you start by saying that didn't happen, then you realize that everything we have done wasn't because of fame, wasn't because, you know, hey, look at me. It was only for one reason, which is we're going to be gone one day, but we can leave this recording behind and maybe people will still listen to it. Maybe they'll get some pleasure out of it. Maybe it'll 
it'll be up there with some of the great songs that that you always play. Um, so that was the dream. It was just it was about the music. And remember what it was like in the olden days. You know, we sat in the dark. We had big speakers. We had high fidelity. We had headphones. We would sit there with our eyes closed and listen to Are You Experienced or Quicksilver Messenger Service or some of these amazing records, right? And and it was all about the doors. It was all about the sound of the music that got into our into our bloodstream. So we are from that era where it really is about record. Um, and we don't know that much about the rest of it. This is kind of different for us. Um, and, and so that's why I keep coming back to you know, it's not, we're not going to go on tour. Um, you know, it's not about us personally. It's about these songs as a group. We're, we're proud of them. Um, what would have happened? We would have gone deeper into the channels of kind of music that we love. There would be more acoustic music. Uh, we have, George and I have Martin guitars. Um, we might, Carl might have pulled us a little bit more in the metal direction, which was his trajectory. Um, so we might have gotten heavier in some respects. Um, we would... Uh, probably have gone into some more keyboard stuff. Um, uh, it's 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 hard to say, but I mean, you just would have kind of plowed the channels that we like the most. There'd be saw. You see it on this track. It goes from really soft. If you listen to the back end of Downhill Slide, it doesn't get any slower and more sad and than that. And then you go to Florida Flash Flood, and you're just or Snake Bit. And you can barely keep up. You know, I didn't know if we could keep up when George put those songs out. Um, you know, just he's, he's pure energy. Your this is this is the tough question I always ask folks. Um, you, all the songs are your babies, obviously. But if you had to choose, maybe your favorite, both from the original round and from Hurtling Towards Extin Extinction, do you have a favorite song from both eras? Boy. That's so funny. Um, you know, the one I would highlight to people from the first album is Frostbite Fantasy, which was George's song that started with, an, a, like the Beatles, a, an inside out backwards recording. Um, and then he sings about being stuck out on a frozen night. And we were living in upstate New York, the two coldest winters in, in meteorological history. And, and it was... It was a really great rock song and it had some of the best lead playing and it was just a really, I like that one. I'm very proud of, of the band for backing George on that one. The new album is, that's a hard one. Um, and we, we put forward Living on the Planet Love as the first song because it kind of captured the way Kalaka sounds. It's sort of a quintessential song that like we used to play in the clubs where get girls dancing and uh, vocals and solo and you know, very much in the mold of of our 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 songwriting, but it goes in some directions. I mean, Snake Bit, I think, is going to catch some people's attention. It's um, you know, my love's been Snake Bit over the years. It's kind of a western, has a snapping, uh, you know, bullwhip, um, and it's got the, the second solo in Snake Bit is memorable, and it has horns underneath it. It's just it's an epic sound to me with Carl and George going all out and Mark playing pedal steel. Um, but I also, uh, for me, I'll just say Where Magic Grows is a song that uh, finishes the album. It asks the question, where are we going uh, with the environment? Where are we going with this world? Are we going to make it or not? Is the magic going to save us? Or, you know, kind of poses the question as we as we finish off the whole collection. Um, and that one, I think, uh, I, that one uh, I would put forward for my own songwriting as kind of a, a statement song. So last question, it's kind of a two-part question. Speaking of the future, will there be more new Kalakas music in the future? And given that you have uh, worked with uh, a Blinken before, I know uh, Secretary Blinken's, shall we say, a little occupied right now, but maybe at some point in the future, whenever life settles down a little bit more, could you ever see having some guest folks like maybe the Secretary, maybe Skunk Baxter, whomever, be part of a future Kalakas project? Well, I should let you um, speak for the band here. Um, you know, in the past, if you asked Kalakas, are you guys ever going to do anything again? The answer would be a hard no. And we would all believe that it was a hard no. It's just, no, that was before. We're happy with what we did. But, you know, that was then. And we put out the old collection in 2015. But but no. 
And then here we are with a new album. So no one really saw it coming. We didn't think, let's do an album. We just started making music. And then we liked the result and we kept going and kept doing it. This took over the three or four years. We were just doing what we really care about, which is, can we make a good record? That's, that's the oldest question in the book for artists. Um, and it was never about anything more than that. So I'm not going to answer the question because I don't want to be a liar if we end up doing another some, some more music in the future. I can't say you no. Know, it doesn't. We don't have plans to do more. But you, I'm really excited by the response, and it's just beginning. So who knows? And then with Secretary Blinken, I'm proud to call him my friend. He doesn't, you know, I don't pretend to be influencing his foreign policy. He's a very good man and a very sincere and super smart and trying. He's really serving his country the best he can. Uh, day and night and he's trying to put out the fire in the middle east right now and so you know uh, we should all be proud to have a, somebody that good who can call the president anytime because he's that close to the president and that that's that's rare for even i worked for the great colin powell and you know tony blinken is closer to the to his president than anybody since james baker probably which is which is amazing he's a great musician he's got a great voice uh, he's a wonderful guy, and you know who knows. It'll be a pleasure to see if if there comes a time when he's ready to throw another song my way, and we could try to collaborate and produce something. Uh, I don't think I would say no. So we'll see. It's the future. You never know how it's going to go. But the good news is there's <laughs> right. music to listen to in the in the meantime. Hurtling towards extinction. Kalakas is back. Folks, give it a listen. Anyone listening to this interview, give it a listen. Ambassador, thanks for taking time to chat today. Uh, this has been a really fun interview, and all the best with all of your uh, efforts going forward. Luke, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to all your listeners. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to talk to you all, and have a great day. You as well. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.